Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Fire Pit Fable with me, Owen Staten. The winter winds blow cold, the air is full of chill, and here we are at the fire pit at the heart of the forest, at the time between times. The time, it's neither night nor day, but the sun has gone and the sky is grey. The time when the veil between our world and the fairy world grows wafer, wafer thin. So thin that for a moment, in just a few moments, you can reach into their realm. And for a few moments, they can reach into ours. You see, now is the time that people see lights in the sky. Now is the time that people see the Talwith Teg. And now is the time that people see ghosts. But I am not alone at the fire pit at the heart of the forest tonight. No, I have a very special guest. I am immensely privileged to have with me one of my good friends, the Reverend Peter Laws, podcaster, author extraordinaire, speaker, minister, and a man who has done it all. And here he sits, warming his hands at the fire. Happy New Year, Peter. How are you? I'm good, thanks. It's uh, great to be with you around the fire. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, nice I love yeah, I love being out in these sorts of places. Uh, you know, it's it's so weird. I think that um, like fire can be so mesmerizing because technically it's just things waving around, but it's it just freaks me out of the thought that everyone, when they're around a fire, just kind of looks at it and keeps looking at it. There's this there's kind of a theater going on in it, and uh, there's an angel, there's something that draws you in, isn't there? There is. It's similar to the sea. I find it similar to the us. sea. Yeah, oh, at the at the trees. And there, yeah. the forest, you see the shadows and shadows, shadows. And you know there are things out there, things from story, things that we speak about. But we always feel safe at the fireplace. That's right. Although you are creeping me out a bit now that you mentioned those shadows. <laughs> see, I'm just, just looking over my shoulder. I think I see Peter, the claw. You've come, you've come here tonight. You're a podcaster extraordinaire. You're a minister. You're an author. You're a speaker, public speaker. You're an uncanny um cast member if you like all hmm. these things take us back peter how did this all come about where did this interest come from you have a great interest in horror you have a great hmm. interest in the supernatural in 80s 80s culture old films hmm. all these things where did all that start um, say in the I, I think, yeah i think it probably started at birth in the sense that it's a natural part of my my psyche that I'm just the type of person who I remember at school, if people were talking about uh, there's a, a, you know, there's football going on or, or people were excited about something on television, I would kind of try my best to get into it. Or, and I remember buying the, uh, the Panini sticker albums. So, so if, see if I could learn all of the football names, so I wouldn't feel like such a kind of fraud as a boy. Um, but really that didn't interest me at all. It was when, People mentioned stories about UFOs or uh, ghosts or any, anything really that, that just opened up the possibility that my hometown had an access point to adventure. I think like the film E.T. really meant a lot to me when I was growing up. Not, not so much about the little E.T. alien. I used to find him a bit freaky, to be honest. And I've always wondered, uh, Owen, what happens if you go back to E.T.'s home planet and you find that um, all of his fellow aliens are wearing clothes? <laughs> that, <laughs> you know it could be some sort of weird pest but anyway that aside yeah uh, I, I i had this I, I used to i used to dream about et and i used to lie and i listened to um john williams soundtrack of the the adventure on earth which is this whole bit of 15 minute piece of music at the end of the film and i would visualize and fantasize about being taken away from the school playground and whisked away to some other planet i used to sometimes even say to my my parents, uh, I've got a feeling that maybe you're not my real parents. I think I'm probably adopted because I felt so different, you know, but not different in a bad way. I just kind of felt 
there's some I am meant for magic uh, to, to sound a little bit over the top about it, but that's what it felt. And so therefore it was things in culture that opened the door to those magical experiences that that caught my attention. So yes, things to do with um, aliens and, and UFOs, but I tended to find that things to do with horror or the supernatural particularly had an ability to both scare me, but intrigue me and make me think, gosh, there could be a haunted house next door. That, that, that was exciting. We are a similar age. Um, I know this, we've discussed it mm. before. I can see the last few years you've been doing your podcast thing. You've got wildly successful books out. You're well known in the paranormal community. When you left school, what did you do first? Were you always interested in this line of work? Or I know this is something that didn't exist then, but were Not, you always yeah. looking at you know, going in down the road that you've gone down, really? Yeah, well, well, I mean, certainly it, there's a kind of consistency in the sense that when I was a, a teenager, and I'm talking about a young teenager, like 12, 13, 14, I wanted to be a horror author. That was kind of, you know, like very, very typical, but it was like, imagine you could be Stephen King. And not only Stephen King, but also his books. So many of his books were about authors, and I love the idea of mm. authors going to their hometown or some other weird place and researching a book and, and then discovering something scary. And so I thought that would be an amazing job to have. So I, I initially wanted to be an author, but then I discovered music and, and started to learn how to play like the piano and then guitar and then taught myself drums and then singing. And, and, and it was really just anything creative. I just wanted to, I like the idea of having a blank page. And then by the 50 minutes later, it's, ah, it's now a new thing that didn't exist before. But when I left university, it was, when well university was quite a life-changing experience for me because that's where i became a christian and that was really not expected i was very anti-christian up to that point and so it was really a shock to me to what were that. you studying peter um well i studied uh originally i did um applied well i did applied social science sorry at, at, at lancaster and some criminology and some philosophy but i originally went to nottingham trent to study something through clearing because I, I wanted to do advertising at Lancaster and I didn't have the right combination of grades. And so I ended up going to Nottingham through clearing and that didn't work out. And so I went back to Lancaster to study, to study um, sociology and science because I, I, I like that sort of thing, kind of got that sort of brain. But it was there, like I said, when I, when I became a Christian and then that suddenly put an option on my table, which I wasn't expecting, which was it's like a whole like subculture. I had no idea there was such a thing as Christian bookshops, Christian bands, Christian authors, and also you know church ministers and stuff. Because I had never set foot in that sort of place before because I hated that stuff. <laughs> and so yeah, it was when I became a Christian after university. I joined a band and I was touring with a band, singing in a band, and we were touring through England and Wales. So not England and Ireland and um, Germany. And on the on those travels, I bumped into a church in a place called Chesham in Buckinghamshire who were looking for a youth worker. And I was about to get, you know, I wanted to get married to uh, the woman I'm married to now, you know, we were ready to get married. So I stepped out of the band after a year, which was the normal period of time and worked as a youth worker for a while. So that was creative because I was doing crazy weird things with the young people putting on crazy stuff, but it wasn't like writing or anything like that at that point. That's fantastic. And I mean, here you are now a minister as well. So yeah. um, when you look at it on the outside, I'm a Christian myself, Peter, but when you look at it on the outside, you right. look at the horror sort of things that, that you write and then your sort of um, your faith and um, and what you, you sort of um, you preach and you speak. It, it it doesn't look so balanced, does it? And especially in the eighties, there was a big there was a big thing here, wasn't there? Yeah. Where um, you looked at stories and and sort of the horror stories and that they were quite widely frowned mm. upon. I was a, I was a big D and D player back in the eighties, you know, and I can remember the whole oh, yes. satanic panic and all that type of thing. Um, how yeah. have you ever found any opposition in in what you do or any sort of um, struggles in between the two worlds where you exist? There, um, I I found no personal struggles at all, um, but I have certainly met people who've struggled with my love of of those two things. I I see them all part as this, the same continuum. Uh, the people who are interested in the paranormal, and I've I've said this for quite a while. I've written stuff about this, uh, like the 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 reason why Uncanny, for example, is so popular is not just because people are interested in ghosts. I do, with my kind of sociologist hat on, think it's part of almost like a new religious movement. Uh, 
a, a rediscovery of a spirituality that makes sense for the modern age, a sense of kind of testable spirituality that doesn't make any kind of unreasonable moral demands on us, but just opens up a door to the possibilities of, of a kind of spectral realm and says, is, are we alone? Which are very similar questions to what Zaster Church is. But yeah, I, um, I don't personally see any issues between the two, but that's because I've always been a person who is very happy to hold contrary views at the same time, because I'm, I'm not really into black and white, which frustrates some people. And I, I also don't think it's that much different anyway. Life is, life is filled with um, scary stuff, and we need to reflect on that. But when I, when I enjoy a horror film, and I've written about this in, in a book called The Frighteners, Why We Love Monsters, Ghosts, Death and Gore, which explains, you know, why it's healthy, I think, to have a morbid interest. Like, I, I don't, when I'm watching, say, a, a scary horror film, I'm not actually enjoying the pure negative parts of that in the sense of if I read a news report that, you know, the guy down the road has been stabbed by a bunch of kind of kids in hoodies on the street because he was protecting his car. I, I have a very different reaction to that. I'm horrified and disgusted and saddened. Um, not only for the the man, but also like, oh gosh, the, like the parents of these teenagers who did this, and I'm sure they didn't want to do this, but they did. Um, but when I enjoy a horror film, it's I know it's not real, and so there's something about the playful theatrics of taking the things that scare you and putting putting them into predictable patterns that I find to be very liberating, especially because I get scared of things like death and I can get anxious about the the possibility of, you know losing our lives and losing loved ones so for me they're all it's all it's all tools to try and figure out um some sort of meaning and magic amongst the chaos and the scary stuff but for others they just think black and white and they say hang on a minute if you like god you know you should be into cliff richard you shouldn't be listening to slayer you know <laughs> you shouldn't be like <laughs> you know watching you know you shouldn't be blasting zombies heads in video games and i'm like i'm not chopping off a real person's head that would be a bit, sorry, bad. Yeah. <laughs> a bit. <laughs> That's great, Peter. So you became a youth worker, and did that lead straight yeah. into you in, into you becoming a minister, or yeah, was it there did really. In between? Okay. No, it it did because I mean I was I was working as a youth worker for six years, and I was trying to figure out what to do next. And um, you do start getting people in churches say, "Oh, well, have you thought about becoming a church minister?" You know, for all ages. And I was very reluctant to do that. I wasn't very keen. And so my wife and I decided, let's try an experiment. And um, we said, let's, let's pray a prayer uh, where we'll put this to the test and we'll say, we'll, I'll consider being coming a minister if 50 individual people, independent of one another, randomly come up to me and say the sentence, I think you should be a church minister. <laughs> and we deliberately set that quite high because I just thought, I didn't really want to do that. And I, and I didn't expect anyone would actually do that. But my wife would keep a little tally of people who would say it to her. And then I would keep a tally in a book who would say it to me. And then we noticed around this time, we would get back together on an evening, you know, over dinner and we would say, who said it to you today? Anybody? And she'll say, yeah, three people came up to me. I'll say, oh, well, I had seven people today. And it gradually grew higher and higher. It did eventually reach 50, which was amazing. But what was more powerful about that was the excitement that we had when the numbers went up, because that revealed something in my heart I didn't yeah. expect to be there, which was actually a desire to do that. And so I, yeah, you know, when I was, when I, when I was say, saying, what have you got today? It was a hopeful, I hope you've got more. And that was quite an eye opener for me. That's incredible. So you become a minister. At what point then did you decide to start to go back to your, your initial dreams mm. of becoming a writer, of um, uh, the podcasting, you know, getting out there and, and being a voice really in the, in the sort of supernatural community, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose when I, uh, when I was training to be a, a minister, I do remember sitting with some of the um, tutors and, and, and saying, look, the guys around me, like they're training to be, become a church minister and they are talking as if like they're going to be like the local vicar in a church for the rest of their lives. And, you know, good for them, but I don't see myself as doing that for the rest of my life. I don't know what it means. And I think I should be doing this now and I should be training, but I just, you know, am I in the wrong place? And they said, no, no, keep going. And so it wasn't a shock for me that after I'd been a minister in a church for six years, and it wasn't like I had a big problem with it or I hated it or, I, you know, I didn't like run off with the, 
member of the congregation and then get kicked out or anything like that. There was no scandal involved. There was purely a walk with my wife one day through the fields and me spotting some sort of cow or animal. And when I saw this cow kind of getting this idea for a, a book, a novel, a scary novel, and um, it wasn't even about a cow, but I don't know what, maybe the cow <laughs> told, me the, told me the tale. And then went home and just started writing this story. And then gradually the story became an actual, a full book. And it's a long story, but um, as, as in how I got published, but eventually after quite a lot of rejections, got, a, got an agent and then got a two book deal for fiction. And it was when that happened, it all coincided with uh, our children being very young. My wife uh, was working full time and, and she wanted to go back to work. So it just seemed like the right time for me to focus on writing books while, you know, raising the children. And so what that, was that first book? Oh, that book is called Purged. It's, it's part of a series of, of a crime fiction. It's kind of supernatural type series about the main character is called Matt Hunter. And he's an ex church minister turned atheist professor who helps the police solve religiously motivated crime. And in the first book, Purged, he's on the trail of a Christian serial killer who baptizes his victims as adults and then murders them immediately afterwards to mm. ensure that they go straight to heaven and not lose their, um, their place there. Otherwise, wow. if they lose their faith, they'll go to hell. So he thinks yeah. he's doing everyone a favor, but obviously he's just a raging psychopath. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, so writing those books was, was a real kind of trip for me, although, you know, challenging not just to write, but to kind of get people on board with reading them because my publisher was, it was great, but it wasn't a huge publisher. And I, I almost got signed by a very big publisher and they all were keen on it at the publishers, apart from the marketing guy who said, you know, well, is this horror? Is this crime fiction? We can't tell. So I, I, yeah, that was sad because if that had happened, I'd probably, <laughs> I'd probably have a different life now, but anyway, maybe not. But yeah, so those, um, those, those books came out, which was wonderful. But the fourth one of that called Possessed, which is about the, uh, the, the recent and quite intriguing growth in demand for um, exorcism in churches. Um, so that book also featuring Matt Hunter is about that topic. But as I uh, was writing that and that came out during COVID and it was during COVID that I, oh, and it was weird. I didn't even have the desire to read a book, never mind write a book. I, 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 I didn't read any books during COVID. I read Viz comic and I read like very short form stuff and I watched YouTube and I watched films and stuff like that, but I had no interest in creating something long form. And that's when podcasting came back into my life. I had, I had done some podcasting actually, I was kind of one of the early guys back in uh, 2007. I had a podcast about uh, films and the horror films and the uh, religious aspects of them. But uh, if only Owen, oh, and I'd started with frightful, which is my current podcast, which is scary, yeah. true stories. Cause if I'd started scary, true stories back then, you know, probably cause I was so early, I probably would have kind of had a much of a, I mean, it's pretty big frightful, but it would have been even bigger. But um, no, I started with obscure. Hey, let's watch uh, let's watch Stephen King's Carrie and try and work out the theological parts. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, that had a bit of a following, but it's very niche. But yeah, podcasting came along, and, and so I started a, a podcast called Creepy Cove Community Church, which is uh, a very strange, like Songs of Praise meets Stephen King. And I did that because I felt I just really felt for the people during COVID who were isolated in their homes and didn't have any kind of natural community to go to online. Whereas me in, a ch in the church world had, had loads of invitations to, oh, do you want to come to our church service online? And people were just connecting left, right and center at home through Zoom and stuff. And I thought, wait a minute, there's no reason why, you know, my anybody, no matter what they believe, they might want to go to church, but it doesn't have to be a church that forces them to believe anything. So I thought, why not create a fictional church that's set in a haunted fishing town and um, got vampires and monsters in it? And let's just put the services out with full songs. And it's like you're attending church. And, and, and that's when I started getting back into podcasting, because that, that was quite a special little show to work on. That was great. And you do Our Curious Past as well, which... Um, yes, uh, that's right. Does. Which that's, yeah. that's popular as well, isn't it? That's going really well. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's popular in the sense that, you know, in the podcasting world, I'm very fortunate to get adverts and get, get companies to want to advertise on, on both Frightful and 
our curious past, although that can be up and down, you know, sometimes, you know, over the, in 2023, there was a, a couple of months where there was no ads and that that's a real challenge because no ads makes no money. So that it can, it can be a real challenge, but you know, they, they, they pick back up sometimes, but creepy cove was, um, was simply too niche to get any advertisers interested. And I totally got that. And that's when I started my Patreon because I thought, no, you know, and I, I, no one's going to want to advertise on this, but there, there are, I was so touched by people contacting me saying things like, listen, I'm a Satanist, <laughs> I'm an atheist or, or a humanist or whatever. I do not like church, but I love attending Creepy Cove, you know, attending as in on, online. Yeah. And um, I started setting up the, the Patreon and the Patreon's still going. And that's been just a, a, a really magical little, little group and encourage, such, such a core encouragement for me. You also have a great interest in the supernatural. I mean, you've written for the Fortune mm. Times. You've appeared on Uncanny. I mean, growing up to me, a hero of mine was always Father Line and Farnthrop, you know? So, oh, um, you're, yes. You're almost like yeah, a I had pizza new, with him. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, he's as, a as lovely, a lovely guy. guy. Yeah. yeah. But, you, you know, you've gone down a similar route to himself. How did that come about? How did you um, get onto Uncanny? How did the 14 sort of writing come along and that sort of thing? Well, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the 14 times I'd, I'd always been a fan of that magazine, uh, you know, and and, and kind of it, it's quite hard to get into the magazine as in like to get a, get an article published. And so I was like, oh, gosh, it'd be great to do that. And then it was just a, I, I did my master's degree and for my master's thesis, I explored the, the links between horror films and uh, and religion. That, and this is when I started doing the podcast, basically, because the podcast was a part of exploring that topic. And uh, as I did that, I thought, oh, I can maybe pitch an article for this to the Fortune Times, which I did. And thankfully, the editor liked it and, and wanted to run it, so he did. And then after that, I started writing reviews for um, horror movies for them. And then after a while, they... They came back and said, you know, we like this. Uh, would you like to have a column? And ever since then, and this is like 10 years ago, ever since, for the last 10 years, I've written a, a monthly column for the 14 times, which just kind of is, blows my mind a bit, really. And occasional articles for them on topics. And of course, the 14 times is all about the paranormal, even though a lot, my, a lot of my stuff for them is about horror. It's about like supernatural horror and, and ghosts and whatnot. Because uh, again, I've always been interested in that because they have helped me uh, consider that maybe there is hope beyond death <laughs> to be too, <laughs> not to be too grand about it, uh, mm. which is exactly the similar reason why I'm attracted to the religion. Uh, although I'm also put off religion in many, many ways, but I'm sure we don't have time to go into all of that, but I am not, I'm not your typical Christian. I suppose I've been, I've been banned from churches. I mean, like the church I was, uh, in for 10 years like I, i'm not I'm not allowed to go there anymore i'm not allowed to preach there anymore because i, I said i was happy for people to be gay so so it's that it's you know it, it hasn't been without its 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 opposition yeah. but the but the supernatural has been a passion of mine and an interest and then i think because i had like i don't know if it was because i had the frighteners out which was explaining why it was fine to like this stuff or because of my link with the 14 times, I, I'm not sure, but Danny Robbins just contacted me. And this was in the very early days of Uncanny and asked if I would be willing to be an expert on series one, episode one. And so I was at the, on the very, very first episode, which was fantastic because it was like such a core episode in, uh, um, in, in that, you know, the bloody hell Ken episode. Yeah. Uh, and after that, it's been, you know, my uh, privilege to be invited for, all, I've been on all seasons now, and it's 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 great to be a part of that. It's 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 a, it's a privilege, you know. It's um, it's been amazing oh, to see how that's it's always grown. it's always a joy to listen to you on that, Peter, as well. Oh, thank you're you. really you're really busy. I can tell you're really successful. The books are out there. The podcasts are going strong. Um, your ministry as well, as well as the uncanny and 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 speaking. What do you do to relax? Well, um. A few things really. I mean, one of my favorite things to do is uh, on every every Saturday, I take my kid, one of my kids, to this special kind of club, this sort of performing arts type thing, where he's in there for like three hours, and while he's in there, I just go for a long walk, listening to podcasts or um, books or music, and then I'll find a coffee shop and I'll just sit and read a book. And I, they are precious times for me. I just love the walk and then the sitting down and reading 
this comic or some book on the paranormal or whatever uh that that's really lovely but also i i mean i i i i, I kind of like recently for example like i replaced my uh, virtual reality headset with a, a meta quest 3 and um I, I do love like you know i mean i've got a slight injury on my hand because i was like fighting a dragon demon last night with sword fighting in my back room and i got a bit carried away and punched a wall <laughs> But you know, just being immersed in these virtual worlds uh, is—I I, that—I find that relaxing. Um, but, all, but I mean, I, I do kind of—I do exercise and like I do yoga and that sort of stuff. And that always used to be a grind. And then somehow, just one day, it just was like, "Wow, this is quite life-giving." Now I'm into it. I think it was when I got an Apple Watch and I could measure everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, wow! It's like a competition with myself." <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 I'm good at relaxing. You know, I, um, I like to relax. I've met some, I've particularly ministers, Owen, who they, they seem to think it's a, a big badge of honor to never take a day off. And yeah. I just look at those people and say, well, yeah, I hope you enjoy your breakdown when it comes. <laughs> <We're>, um, <laughs> the fire is growing um, low, Peter, and the night grows dark. So our time mm. is, is almost, almost at an end here. Whenever I ask someone to come to the fire pit, I always ask them to think about stories um, that have meant something to them or um, something that in their past has always excited them or a tale they would like me to tell. Now, when we, we spoke about you coming on the podcast, you mentioned something that was quite different. And um, would you like to tell um, our friends what that was or what, what tale you'd like me to tell? Yeah, when you asked me for, to tell it, that you were going to tell a tale I, like immediately without even thinking about it my favorite poem uh from edgar Allan poe came to mind which is annabelle lee and i i just adore this poem and it's not i mean it's not like i'm big into poetry by the way so when i say it, it's my favorite poem you know it's not like i read a lot of poetry but this is that one of those poems that just it moves me it's this thought of kind of a, a, a man who has lost lost his love and it, and it means a lot to me, the poem, and, and, and I once had to read it out somewhere and I couldn't get through it because I just found myself yeah. getting upset because uh, it's so moving. And sometimes I do this, I, I, I can read just language itself and the way a sentence is structured, even if it's not about something moving, I find myself getting emotionally moved because I think something amazing is going on with these words here and they're touching me. And this is a, is a poem that has lots of that. So I love that. But, but one of the reasons as well why it's special to me is because I, I mean, I've been privileged to, you know, go to places like horror conventions and stuff where I've been on the bill with other people. And I'm just this little lowly guy signing books. Um, but I remember once I went to dinner with, um, with a bunch of different kind of horror stars. And then I had breakfast in the morning with a, an actor called Jeffrey Coombs, who played um a reanimator who's one of my favorite he was in star trek and stuff but he was in one of my favorite horror films called reanimator and he was doing an edgar Allan poe one man show and i just over breakfast told him about annabelle lee that i loved it and he just like put down his croissant or whatever and just burst into the whole thing in in character in this pub and i just remember thinking like oh my goodness and like the night before uh, D. Wallace, the actress who you know plays um, the mother in E.T. Like we went out with her, and she bought me Wagon Mamas, and then I'm there with like some guy out of the Lost Boys, and I'm there with all these Italian horror film directors. I've always respect and having drinks with them, and that whole weekend was amazing. And this poem was just like wow, a, gl a glimpse into 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 magic, and um, and it's sad but moving. That was a very long introduction. Sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. And I will, I will do my best to do to do justice to Annabelle Lee for I'm you. I'm sure you will. Um, before I go into that, uh, I'm sure our friends have enjoyed our chat here tonight. I've I've really really enjoyed Peter, and I'm I'm so grateful for you joining me tonight. Where can people okay. find you if they want to hear more from you? Well, I mean, it, probably the best place to go is peterlaws.co.uk, which is kind of the, the central hub of all of my stuff. So there's books and podcasts and, and other things there. I'm, I'm on all the social media places, Rev Peter Laws. Um, but yeah, if you went to peterlaws.co.uk, or to be honest, if you just Google Peter Laws, um, I tend to come up. And um, yeah, I'd love people to get in touch and explore things. And if anyone out there wants to join the Patreon, no pressure, but it's patreon.com forward slash Peter Laws. Always got to make sure I get that in. 
That's brilliant, Peter. <laughs> I want to thank you so much. Um, the fire thank pit you. has been really warm tonight and the company has been excellent. Diolch Peter. Thank you very, very much indeed. Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago, in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabel Lee, so that a high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels not so happy in heaven went envying here and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. So all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in the sepulchre by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. And that, my friends, was Annabel Lee by Edgar Allan Poe for my friend, the Reverend Peter Laws. Thank you so much for joining us here at the fire pit at the heart of the forest. Normal service will resume in the next episode. But in the meantime, I will put Peter Laws, Patreon, in the show notes and his website where you can find him and support him. And also, if you want to support Time Between Times, I am at ko-fi.com forward slash Owen Staten or patreon.com forward slash Owen Staten 7. Peter Laws is reverendpeterlaws.com. Thank you, my friends. Take care. No star. Thank you.